going to go over exercise 31 and what you need to do to complete this assignment. So let's start with, let's start right here. So note that there's data that's provided in a section called data for additional computational practice. I've typed this into an Excel file and we have an SPSS file that I'm making available to you to use for your analysis. Or you can just type this data in yourself. So let's start with number one. Do the example data meet the assumptions for the independent samples t-test? So exercise 16 went over what those assumptions are. You can find those in the textbook or in the lecture slides. So you don't have to list all of them, um, but just tell if they do meet that. So one way you could do that actually is say, this is an assumption, yes or no it's met. This is the assumption, yes or no it's met. So different ways to do this, but give a little bit of uh, discussion here about why, give a reason, yes or no, you think it was met. Number two, if calculating by hand, draw the frequency distributions for the dependent variable wages earned. What is the shape of the distribution? If using SPSS, what is the result for the Shapiro-Wilk test of normality for the dependent variable? All right, so we have a few different things here, but we want to do the frequency distribution of the variable wages earned. Now, I, I don't want you to draw this by hand. I'd like you to use some sort of program to do this. You could use Excel, SPSS, or even an online, um, an online program. So let me show you how to do this in Excel first. So I have my data typed into Excel, and I've provided this data for you. Just to make it easier, I put it onto two different tabs so I don't get too much in the same tab. So what I'm going to do first is start with descriptive statistics. It wants me to look at the frequency and also shape of the distribution. So I'll create those graphs, but I'll start with descriptive statistics for the two groups. And this is going to help me answer a couple of the questions that come after this also. So I'm going to come up here and go to the data tab and click on data analysis and descriptive statistics. And first I want to do the descriptive statistics for my treatment group. So I'm going to change this to the range that I want it to be. It's grouped by columns. I have my labels in the first row, but I'd like my output to be underneath this table. So I'm going to select that and make sure you check the summary statistics box and then click OK. So here I have my descriptive statistics for my treatment group. And then let me do the same thing for my control group. It's going to remember what I did most recently. So I need to change this to the new range that I want it to be. I can't see very well. There we go. So I just moved that box so I could see the range better. Group by columns. And let me change my output range. Otherwise, it's going to put it right where that other table is. So I'm going to change it to here. And make sure summary statistics and labels in the first row are checked. And then go ahead and click OK. And just I'll make this a little wider to be easier to see here. Oops. There we go. And just so I don't confuse myself later, I'm going to put that this is my treatment group and this is my control group so that I can keep track of it. Now, if you're using this data in SPSS, it might look a little different. You can tell it which group each of the participants are in. And so that file is set up a little differently than how it will look in Excel. But here's what we have in Excel. So I have my descriptive statistics. And let me go ahead and do the frequency distribution. Now the question didn't ask for the frequency distribution to be separated based on treatment or control group. I could do that, but I'm just going to go ahead and do it all together. And what I've gone ahead and done for you is create this little shortcut that is going to be um, going to have the data summarized. So this is, I divided my wages into ranges that made sense to me, 0 to 100, 100 to 200, and 200 to 300, and 300 plus. 
And so I just counted up how many were in each of those ranges. Uh, there's more complicated methods I could use. I could use a function to count how many there are for me, but I don't have that many data points. So I just went ahead and counted and figured up I had three in this group, nine in this group, six in this group, and two in the 300 plus group. So let me go ahead and insert that frequency distribution, which is just kind of a fancy way of saying that graph. I want a bar graph that's going to display this information. So I'll come up to the Insert tab, click Charts. I didn't select my data first. So select your data, come up here to Charts, and I want to look at all charts. It's recommending the um, this cluster column chart for me, which is good. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And I know that you, know, you can see what mine looks like because I selected the data, but I want you to copy and paste yours into that Excel file. So you're still gonna have to create this for yourself. Um, I'm gonna change the color on mine so that it doesn't look exactly like yours. Make it kind of an unusual color. You can change the color on yours to whatever you'd like it to be, but let me go ahead and make mine this color. And then I need to add my titles. So I'm going to add a title of wages. And when I click away from that, it'll be there. Let me add my or my um, vertical title. And I'm going to make this title frequency. And then I need to change the overall chart title to something that makes sense. So um, this was weekly wages. So I'll do something like weekly wages for treatment and control group, something like that. So this is my chart. So I can copy this, just do control C, go back to my Word file, and paste that in there. I'll change that color blue a little bit. Make this a bit smaller, just so it doesn't take up so much room here. And then the next thing that I need to look at is what's the shape of the distribution? So I can just kind of eyeball this, but that's one reason I wanted to do those descriptive statistics. If you're using SPSS, look at the Shapiro-Wilk test. If you're using Excel, just go ahead and look at the descriptive statistics that we ran. And we're gonna look at the kurtosis and skewness and interpret those. So remember the rule of thumb I gave you was more or less than two. Some people look at more or less than one, but we're gonna look at more or less than two um, would be considered substantial skew or kurtosis. So look at these results and interpret that. So what do you think is it overall normal distribution? Uh, what are the means for the two groups wages earned? So either here or in that previous spot, just go ahead and copy these tables. And then I can see that you, that you ran those tables for both of the variables. One, if you answer a question wrong, I'll see, you know, I see that you did it, maybe just didn't quite interpret it right, so you can get some more credit that way. And then also, this will just help you being able to look at this and, uh, make your conclusion. So what are the means for the two groups wages earned? So go ahead and list those here. Uh, what's the independent samples t-test value? So we need to go ahead and run a t-test to figure this out. So independent samples t-test. So let me come back to my Excel file. And to run a t-test, I might need to have my data all together, but let me take a look in the tool pack and see. So let me go to the data analysis tool pack. I don't want descriptive statistics anymore. I want to look at the t-test. And this is an independent sample, so what I need to figure out is if I have equal or unequal variance, so I know which of these to choose. So I'm going to look at the variance for these two. And the variance is quite different. The wages are quite spread out for those. So the variance is quite different. 
So in this case, I'm going to do the t-test with unequal variance because the variance of this group is more than double the variance of the other group. So it's just a really large difference between the two. So I'm going to do the t-test assuming unequal variance. And I need to tell it where my data range for 1 is. So it, data laid out like this is OK. So here's my data for my treatment group. And then I need to tell it here's my data for my control group. And I didn't select those labels, so I'll leave this blank. I'm OK with a 0.5 significance, so I'll leave that. But I need to change my output. And I'll just go ahead and put that. Um, over here next to my other results. Double check everything. It looks OK, so I'll click OK. And here's my results for my t-test with unequal variance. So what I'd suggest you do, just go ahead and copy this and just paste this right into that file. And then I'll see exactly what you did. So that result for the t-test is 4.22. So just list that here, 4.22. But mm -hmm. I need to have this table in here. You can't just list 4.22 because we just kind of did that. Is this test significant at the alpha equals 0 0.05 level? So here I'm going to look at my p-value. Well, I've got two p-values that were reported with my table. I have one tail p-value and a two tail p-value. So this is going to come back to what my hypothesis was. Did I hypothesize a specific direction or just that there is a difference between two groups? So you're going to decide what your hypothesis was and then choose the relevant p-value to look at and compare that p-value to the level of significance. And we've been talking about this, review the significance lecture and hypothesis testing lecture if you need some help on interpreting that conclusion. So we compare our p-value to that level of significance. If using SPSS, what is the exact likelihood of obtaining a t-test value at least as extreme or as close to the one that was actually observed, assuming that the null hypothesis was true? Well, what this is getting at, it's just asking the p-value. And so we can get this from SPSS, Excel, or other software. It's not just an SPSS exclusive that we can get the p-value. The p-value is the likelihood of getting a value as extreme as what we observed if there's no difference between the groups. So you just would list that p-value here for that test. Which group earned the most money post-treatment? Okay, so we need to look at this and we need to interpret our results. So here we're going to look at the means between the two groups. Right, so we're going to come up here and look at what the means were for the two groups and see what the difference is between those two. So interpret those results. Which group earned the most money? Number eight, write your interpretation of results as you would in a formatted journal. So just use a format similar to what you see them using in the chapter. So we would say something about the test that we ran and what we found from our test. Put this back into the experiment in the first place. We wanted to test to see if the if the treatment group would have higher wages than the control group. So we've made a decision about whether this is a significant result or not. So this is step seven of that hypothesis testing. Put it back into the experimental language. So do we have enough evidence that there is a difference between the two groups? So what did we do here and, and what were our results? So give that kind of shorthand for the results that you see them giving with T comma uh, or T parentheses degrees of freedom equals what our T value was comma and then what your P value. That shorthand notation that you see in the textbook. Go ahead and copy that format. Um, number nine, what do these results indicate regarding the impact of supported employment 
on vocational rehabilitation on wages earned. So interpret this information based on these results and if our result is significant or not, which is your conclusion that you are making, what is this telling us about this program? Is it effective in increasing wages earned? Okay, so apply that information. Number 10, was the sample size adequate to detect significant differences between the two groups? So we've talked about how sample size really influences significance. When we have a larger sample, we're more able to find significant results. So apply that to the sample sizes that we had here. Do you think those were adequate to find a difference? And then give a little explanation for why. And you know, whatever your interpretation of this was. Is the sample size adequate to answer this question? Do we need more studies or, or what? So this is how we would do exercise 31. If you need more assistance with running the t-test in Excel, I also have a video about how to run a t-test in Excel, and I can uh, link to that down below this one. Now remember when you save your file, come up here to File, Save As, and then at the end of this, just type in your last name, whatever your last name is there, and save so that I can keep track of whose files are whose and we don't have a bunch of files just with all the same names.